All right. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for joining the House of Seal Ministries today on Yah's holy, most holy day of the week, the Shabbat. We thank you for joining us to continue in the lesson series where we've dedicated time to understanding the audience of Paul's letters or the Pauline epistles. This is part 14, sponsored by the House of Shiloh Ministries and presented by yours truly, uh, Brother Andrew Bradley. We are working our understanding in Ephesians. We've gone through Romans, Galatians, and now we're in Ephesians. And we're going to go ahead and get started with um, chapter 2. Well, we've already started chapter 2, but we're going to continue in chapter 2, where we build our understanding of the audience in Paul's letters. As with the previous part, part 13, we, we must understand that Paul has no authority to change the purpose of the scriptures he quote, because what we don't learn in the church is that Paul is quoting scripture and he's quoting the Old Testament. So there's no authority in anywhere that Paul would have said, you know what, I'm going to repurpose this scripture for a group of people that it was never written to. It was written to a group of people for hundreds of years, thousands of years. And all of a sudden, boom, Paul comes along and says, you know what? It's for you, Chinese. He didn't do that. Paul doesn't have that authority. Or it's you, whoever, from Alaska, you know, or, or North or the, or the Arctic. Mm -hmm. Paul does not have that authority. And I'm not, I'm not, again, that's not talking about salvation. We're talking about the audience. All right. So let's go ahead and get started on the first one. And it's Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But Elohim, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Mashiach. By grace are ye are saved. So Paul's here just to pay attention to the small words. It's saying we were dead in sins. Dead why? Death because you were disobedient to Torah. That's what's the definition of sin resulting in a spiritual death because Paul talks about both. He doesn't talk about a physical. He's talking about a spiritual death because if it was a physical death. Paul wouldn't be writing this letter, right? Mm -hmm. So we know this is a spiritual death. We also have already spoken of in chapter two, how the law was given to one, right? Israel, and that Paul is referencing Israel as Ephesians because he's, he'll speak to it. And, and as we go through these letters, we're going to learn uh, in this letter alone, we're going to learn that as Paul speaks continually, he just points out the audience constantly. So if Paul says we, then he is including himself with this audience. All right. And we have to consider that. Pay attention. To, he could have easily said, even when you or even when um, me, I was dead in sins, because again, it's about Torah, but he included them. And you can't be sinners without the Torah. I don't care what the church says. The church won't tell you what sin is defined by. If you ask it, well, sins is all unrighteousness. Or I, I was told everything that's not righteous is sin. That's the, that's the definition the church gave me. So they, they don't have, they don't have an understanding of what sin is or don't want. All right. So keeping that in mind, we're going to start proving in chapter two, just how much Paul is really speaking to one people. All right. Minister White, you mind being the first reader? Okay. Wherefore, remember that ye being in the past Gentiles, I'm sorry, in time past Gentiles, let me start that over. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Mashiach, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without Elohim in the world. Thank you. Thank you. I love this. So we're about to hit some home runs with this one. In time past Gentiles, think about that. How can you no longer be a he non-Hebrew? Think of, It's like saying, in time past, I was Chinese, but now I'm not. I'm something else. Or in time past, past, I was a black man, but now I'm something else. 
<laughs> How can you physically, if Gentiles really means a physical identity, as we're taught, non-Hebrews, how can I be that in time past? The way the church is going to say is, oh, that's because we're spirituals, Israel now. <laughs> we have been adopted, but we've already talked about adoption and made it clear. That's not true. We know the adoption belongs to one mm -hmm. and only one. And we know there's no spiritual. That spiritual conversation is mute. As I look at it, it they can't even back it up themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So mm -hmm. in this reference, Gentiles should be a nation. You were a nation of people in the flesh, in the past, right? That's what that should be. But we're going to get a better understanding once we break these words down that are highlighted. And I think it's important for us to do that is because the church does not teach us to look up definitions. And since they include everybody saying, oh, everybody has this, everybody has this, they assume Aliens, commonwealth, and strangers to the covenant is applicable to anybody. Correct. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh, now, what's, like I said, seeing clear now the teachings of the church, I, I'm, and shamefully, it, it's really ridiculous how they teach this. It's shameful. And, you know, we were in it for so many years. I was in it for so many years. Yeah. So, any any comments? No, okay. We're gonna, the word is strange. Just go look that down next screen. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna dig into that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's look at alien. We need to understand this because because you're not gonna get it just by reading the English. Mm -hmm. And it's Apollo Trio or Trio. Greeks know they had a slick, fast tongue with these words, mm -hmm. and it means to be a non-participant. To participate, excuse me, to be shut out from one's fellowship and intimacy. So right now, the Ephesians, they were shut off. But from what? What were they shut off to? That's what we're going to learn on the next slide. Okay, keep that in mind. We're going to build on this. Commonwealth. Politia. Like politics or the political arena, or a people. Mm. Citizenship. The rights of a citizen. So the Ephesians were cut off from their fellowship as citizens of Israel. Mm. So it's building. It's building. All right? Oh, okay. And now let's look at strangers. Oh, sorry, we have a pop up. Hmm. Oh, that's actually on my screen. Let me let me get that. I'm this sorry. Screen. Oh, I'm like, how much is my screen? Okay. Sorry, okay. audience. <laughs> I'll get ready. I'll get ready to say something. But I thought you saw it. Yeah, I saw it, but you know how you used to seeing it pop on other people, and you didn't realize it was mine. I, I didn't know that software would do that. It links up to my phone. I'll have to make sure that's shut down next time. So excuse the pop-up. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, so let's continue. Like, I'm pops, I'm trying to yeah, that, that's a neat, neat little software that syncs with my phone. So if I'm working on this, I can type on stuff. So. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. So let's, let's continue. So strangers, strangers, Xenos, without the knowledge of or... Um, without a sharing. These these are Thayer's definitions. Thayer Greek lexicon definitions. It also says this to this. Shut off from the citizenship of Yasharel. All right. That's how we're going to put this together. Without the knowledge of or a share in the covenants of promise. All right. And we've already talked about the promises extensively in Genesis. So we know who the promises go to. Yasharel, the seed of Abraham. We know that for a fact. We broke that down. There's no way you could twist and say the promises belong to somebody else. We did that in Galatians. We know the promises, Yasharel. All right? Everybody follow? I'm trying to. Are you going to break down that word commonwealth? Mm -hmm. We did. We spoke on it just to say that it was the citizenship. I didn't break oh. it down any further. Oh, okay. What does that mean, though? I'm, I'm confused about. That means that uh, if you're a citizenship, that means citizen of that of that um, of that group of that organization or that that country. That means there are benefits 
that comes with being a, a citizen. Whereas mm-hmm. if you were just a visitor, you don't have those same benefits. Right. C- correct. Is that okay? Correct. And we're, it will come together. Let's let's read it. Let's read it on the next slide. Miles, go here. We go. Let's read it on the next slide and do a restatement of it to 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 make it sound a little better. Put it all together. Okay. So wherefore remember that ye being in time past a nation in the flesh who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in flesh made by hands. That at that time you were without Mashiach being shut off from the citizenship of, of Israel, right? Mm-hmm. Without the knowledge of the covenants of promise, having no hope and without Elohim in the world. So if it's a citizenship, that means you have the rights as an Israelite, as, a, as Yasharel, and all that pertains to Yasharel. A citizen, you cannot be a citizen of of a nation without being obedient to its laws, statutes, and commandments, right? Mm -hmm. That's the reason why he's saying now that through Yahushua, you have been brought back in as a citizen. And he's going to say that as well. I'm jumping ahead. I'm sorry. But since we know that, how can you fully understand what is written if we are n- not teaching the importance of looking into the source text? Because they wouldn't get this if they didn't look into the source text because they're going to be biased and only go by what they see without reading the rest of the Ephesians. Because you don't have to look into the source text if you just read the rest of the chapter. Okay, and the chapter okay. makes it clear. But they don't do that. But we can avoid it by just showing them this. We know that the covenants of promise of Yashorel, there is not a, a reference of spiritual, right? N- or non Hebrew Yasharel. There is no reference to this because you cannot be of Israel and be a Gentile. You wouldn't be a citizen. You can get a passport. You can, you can get, get your green card, maybe work. <laughs> you can be a visitor. You can be a stranger or a visitor. Okay. Right. And the word stranger here didn't mean the stranger in the Old Testament that we're talking about. Okay. It meant being disconnected from your citizenship. So this word stranger here means more like estranged. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So this 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 sentence being shut off from the citizenship means that you once was a citizen and now you've been shut off. Well, we're going to go there. Okay. Okay. So just to read my notes, I want to make sure I get this clear. This is not a text that can be assigned to just anyone. The Ephesians were shut off or shut out of their citizenship of Yasharel without the knowledge of it, even because it's been so long. They were it was many many centuries. Okay. Or even a share. They didn't even have a share of with the covenant of promise. The covenants of promise. They didn't right. have it. Right. They were shut out because they lived in other nations as other nations. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. They were Hellenized. You got to know where the Ephesians were at. They were a Greek colony. This That lifestyle is what shut them off. And we know that they're most likely the part of the northern tribe kingdoms because they got dispersed centuries ago right. due to disobedience to Yah. Exactly. So you cannot be part of the covenant if you don't know the laws that the covenants of promise are based on. So they got their butt kicked out. And Yah, and Yah said that he was going to do that. Now, Yah doesn't forget his covenant, though. So he, he, he made a way for them to return. And as we continue in, uh, in this chapter, we'll speak more and more to it. Okay? Mm-hmm. In, in, any ads? Anybody wants to add anything? We're good. All right. All right, let's continue. Minister Ryan, mm-hmm. you mind reading for us, please? Yeah, right there. Ephesians 2, 13 to 15. Ephesians 2, 13 through 15. But now in Mashiach Yahusha, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Mashiach. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make him, to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace. All right, thank you, Minister. This is um this has a lot of meaning. Tongue twister. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's a tongue twister. But um 
what I love about it is that Paul says a lot in these two verses. All right. So the, the church doesn't teach this right at all, nor do they understand. Why were the Ephesians far off due to living outside of so Tor, right? Mm -hmm. Yahushua, by his blood, removed the partition between us, he said. Mm -hmm. Between us. Mm -hmm. And then who is us? It has to be Hebrews and Ephesians. And we know that they were Hellenistic Hebrews. They were Hebrews for living in the Greek colonies. All right. And we've established this. We're going to keep adding more so you'll know this for certain that Ephesians were indeed the Hebrews in another nation. So we know that the prior verses prove this. So the Ephesians were separate due to the transgressions of sins. All right. So we're going to go through these words that are highlighted so we can really understand what we're talking about. What's important is Yahushua's blood brought peace. Peace. Who, who was uh, had the wrath of Yah like that, where we needed peace? So all that stuff we're going to talk about in the coming slides to clarify this, to make sure people understand who this is talking to and it's only talking to one people. Okay. All right? Okay. All right. So anybody want to add anything before we start digging into these words? Um, only one comment I had to make was, the wall of partition that he said he had broken down between us, that's the wall of partition between Israel and Yahuwah. Yahushua is the one that broke down the wall to join us back to the Father. Is that correct? It, it's, it, I, you you can say that. Torah. You can say that. It's also the wall between the righteous and those who were in, in disobedience. Because they were disconnected from them That's true too. by 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 practice. Okay. If they would have saw a Hebrew that was Hellenistic, they would have had nothing to do with them because of the life of sin that they had, the disobedience. Okay. When they were given the truth, that wall that was between them was broken down by Yahushua. Because remember, they fought Paul for going out there to mm -hmm. speak. He didn't want him to speak. They wanted that wall to stay up. Yahushua made it possible for Paul to come and do this. Got it. Prior to Yahushua. The northern kingdoms were lost. Understood. Or the the the, the, uh, the both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which I'm sorry. Which both does it mean? We were. <laughs> there was a wall between uh, the, the Ephesians had a wall between them and Yah. Yes. And them and the rest of Israel. Like two walls because yeah, the, the physical wall. Yeah. Did anybody speak of the of the, no, of the no. spiritual? No. No. We were talking about a spiritual wall. We were talking, talking about. about a spiritual wall between the two tribes, the two the, the unrighteous two tribe and the righteous tribe. I was talking about the spiritual wall between Yahuwah and Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I said that for he is our peace, he being the Mashiach, mm -hmm. has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, us being between the Father and Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He took it from another perspective and said he also took down the wall between the unrighteous part of Israel and the righteous part of Israel because they were separated because the righteous Israel had nothing to do with the unrighteous Israel because of sin. Okay. They live separate lives. And you were probably wondering, where was I? I was listening to an, a, another conversation. So there was your conversation that was going on. And I was listening to a conversation that the Heavenly Father was giving me, which was blowing my mind. So I, I couldn't I couldn't split my brain in half like I normally do and listen to both <laughs> conversations because this one required my full attention. Mm -hmm. So it's in Romans. In Romans chapter 8, this is what I found. In Romans chapter 8, it's in verse 7. Okay. It says, because the carnal mind mm -hmm. is enmity, enmity right? Mm -hmm. Against Elohim. That's right. Enmity against Elohim. Mm -hmm. It didn't say anything. Anyone else or anything else? Correct. Is it against Elohim? Yeah, right. It's against the, our Messiah. It's against our Creator. That's right. And then it goes on to say, "For it is not subject to the law of Elohim." Is that exactly. neither indeed can be? That's right. That's Romans eight. Now we're looking at Ephesians here, and it says he's a, abolished in his flesh the enmity. That's right. And then he says, even the law of commandments, and, and the church sees this as the law of commandments being done away, but he's specific. 
Oh, I'll, I'll stay yeah, off we'll that part then. Okay. So what's abolished is what is written in Romans 8 also. Mm-hmm. The hostility that the that the normal human mind has against the word of Yah. Mm-hmm. Against Yah said if it's against my word, then it's against me. Mm-hmm. Because my word and I are one. Right. I'm no different than my word, because if he were, he'd be a hypocrite, right? Right. So the the carnal mind has an enmity against Yahuwah. But Yahusha has come so that we don't have that core of mind and we're no longer hostile towards the most high. Mm-hmm. And he has no more wrath against us either. Right. Right. So those two, those two things are required. And then it says in Romans 8 verse 7 again, that the hostile mind is not subject to the law and cannot be. So my point is, not only is it not subject to the law, but the hostile mind is not even aware that there is a law. Because according to them, there is no law. Mm hmm. It's done away with. Right. But Yah says, no, the mind that is, that's with me knows there is a law and is not hostile towards it. Right. But the ones that are not with me feel there, 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 there is no law. Right. And then they are hostile against it. They don't want it, which means he says, in essence, they are hostile against me. So I was trying to figure out, does this enmity that Yahusha abolished in the flesh removes the wall? Remove the hostility that we have towards Yahuwah mm-hmm. and Romans Romans eight says it does. Mm-hmm. So that's what I was. That's what I was doing. And that's that's the reason. And that makes sense. That r- brings the wall down because now the enmity that I had against my brothers that do all that stuff I felt that was unnecessary. Life doesn't require that. I don't want to hear that nonsense. And then when I come into the truth, all that bitterness, that that enmity towards my fellow brother and sister, mm-hmm. I don't have no more because true. my eyes have been opened to the truth and I've accepted that truth. Instead of saying it don't take all that, now we're saying it takes all that and then, then some. some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, that's very good, Minister White. Very also, good. If the corner mind is against Elohim, and you have Elohim in you because of what you study, what you practice, what you do, what you believe, then the, the enmity is also going to be against you automatically. It, it, that's why, it, exactly. So Paul, it, Paul says, "Yeah, it is." He says, "We, I have a war. That's right. In my members, you exactly. know." That whenever I have a desire to do good, <laughs> evil is always present. Exactly. <laughs> so all that starts to be reversed when you have the petition has come down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Any anybody else? Anybody online? All right. Let's go ahead and move and break right. down break down these um red words for us so we could examine them. So Enmity, ekthra, hostility by implication, mm-hmm. a reason for opposition or even hatred. Mm-hmm. All right. Law, this was of the Mosaic law, Torah, and commandments, the commandments in Torah. Mm-hmm. The word ordinance, which is dogma. All right. That's an opinion, a judgment of the rule. Now, in this one, has a unique definition. Um, and this is what Thayer says of the rules and requirements of the Torah, which carry a suggestion of severity and of threatening punishment. Now that sounds long, but when you put it all together, it makes complete sense. Let's reread this now. But now in Mashiach, Yahushua, ye who were far off are made nigh by the blood of Mashiach, for he is our peace, who has made both one. And has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the hatred and opposition, even the suggested severe and threatening punishment the Torah decrees. Mm -hmm. For to make in himself of twain one new man, one new people, so making peace. All right? Mm -hmm. Does that that make sense now seeing it like that? Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know, the Ephesians lived outside of Torah and were not partakers of the citizenship of promises of the covenant, right? Okay. So we know that they were separated due to this hatred and opposition. And not necessarily, Yah does have it towards that. He hates the sinner. But they also, like Minister White said, they had a hatred towards him. Now, Yahushua's blood removed that enmity, right? Mm-hmm. Being the atonement for sin, removing the, the um, threatening punishment that would have come according to Torah. 
So it's almost like saying we dodged a bullet because of Yahushua. We dodged that bullet. And those who were a separate people, twain, are now are no more separate, but one people by Yahushua's atonement for their transgressions. This, you know, this can't be anyone else except Yasharel. Hmm. Because who had a threatening punishment that the Torah decreed? Was it for the world? No. There's many scriptures saying who the, the law was given to. And not only that, who the judgments of the law belonged to. It wasn't the whole world. Mm -hmm. So, anybody have anything? Any questions? Anybody want to add anything? Is there any any confusion to this? No. no. Okay. Good. 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 Because I was hoping this would this wouldn't um, catch you too off guard. All right. So we'll go ahead and continue. Brother, brother, you mind reading this for us? Because again, Paul is building on this. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right. Ephesians 2, 16, verse 18. And that he might reconcile both unto Elohim, Elohim in one body by the cross, having slain an enemy thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far, were far off. And to them that were nigh. Mm. For though he and him we, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Thank you. Thank you, brother, brother. So look at this. It says reconcile. Apocatalasso. <laughs> Apocatalasso. Mm -hmm. To reconcile back again. To bring back to a former state of harmony. That speaks to the citizenship, Minister mm -hmm. White. Both are reconciled in one body as well as one people. You cannot be brought back if you were never a part of something, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's why the church has to teach you this all-inclusive stuff, because even in Paul's letters, he points to one audience, if you pay attention. Reconcile means to be brought back. Anybody can look that up and figure that out. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would have had to have been there already. To be brought back. Right. That's correct. All right. Anybody want to add anything to this one? Yes. I would like to add um, in the second sentence, and it says, he came and preached peace to you. How does he preach peace? If he's preaching peace, what is the peace that he's preaching? He's preaching to him. That's all he's preaching. Mm -hmm. Because those who have Torah have peace with Yahuwah. Yeah. And those who don't have it have wrath. Okay. So for him to preach peace means he's preaching the gospel of peace, mm -hmm. which is the gospel of the Torah. kingdom. Which, which requires is, the Torah. Which, is, which requires Torah. Mm -hmm. So he's preaching Torah, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of peace. Law brings peace. Law brings yeah, peace. The it Torah sure does. does bring peace because it, it, it brings you in the will of Yah. The obedience True. of Yah. True. So you don't have to suffer wrath. You don't have to suffer the threatening punishment the Torah decrees. <laughs> you don't have to suffer that. So bringing or restoring a former state does not include those who never had it. We have to admit that, church. You cannot be reconciled if you were never part of Israel. Mm hmm. So this, again, hints towards the audience. Mm -hmm. Well, it does more than hint. It makes it, it really points to it. Okay. All right. Now, the far off and nine needed the en enmity removed, right? So let's take a look and continue with this enmity removed. So what is this? The peace that was given to us through Yahushua was needed because of what? Just a bit. There's many verses to show you that when it comes to sin, there, like Minister White just said, there is no peace for the sinner. And Isaiah says it in 57, 20 and 21, but the wicked are like the troubled sea, 
when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my Elohim, to the wicked. What is wicked? Rasha, guilty of sin. So as long as we're disobeying Torah, there is no peace for those, for any of those, for any people. That's correct. Mm -hmm. For any of those who are supposed to be in the covenant with Yah and Torah is required of us, there is no peace for us. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to make sure um, that was put in here so you can know that this is this is true. And coincidentally, Minister White already spoke to it. <laughs> I didn't know it was lesson stepping again. I didn't know it was lesson step. <laughs> right. I didn't know that. So, any questions online? No, thank you. Well, okay. Sister Billy, you mind reading this one for us, please? Okay. Mm. Ephesians 2, 19, 20. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of Elohim, and built upon the foundation of the apostles okay. and prophets, Yehusha Hamashiach himself, being the chief cornerstone. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Billy. So Paul, is state, Paul states okay. that you are no more strangers, no more disconnected, and unaware of and not allowed to be fellow citizens of the Commonwealth of Israel. So this means that they must have had a citizenship previously. Mm -hmm. You are no more strangers. So you must have had a citizenship previously. You have to understand the, the big picture. Mm -hmm. What is the foundation of the apostles and prophets? It can't be the New Testament. It didn't exist. Just like we spoke of in the last lesson. The New Testament didn't come around until like 4th century. The letters of Paul and the Gospels, all the work writings in the New Testament didn't show up until about 70 AD. So what is the foundation of the prophets and the apostles? And he says, and... Now he says the fellowship with the saints and of the household of Elohim and are built upon the foundation. That foundation was the original scriptures, the Old Testament, and Yahushua Hamashiach himself being the chief cornerstone of the Old Testament. Mm. Now look at this. Do you see the definition of saints in this verse, these two verses? Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints who are already Citizens. The, <laughs> yeah. They were already citizens. So who yeah. who are the saints here? Mm -hmm. The citizens of the kingdom. Yasharel. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Everybody want to throw that word around in church. Priests, Catholics will say you have to die first to get this title. Right. The, the Pentecostal and Presbyterian church says everybody's a saint when you become the believer mm -hmm. in the Messiah. Mm hmm so if, if the Ephesians were not fellow citizens with the saints, being separated by a partition, and now has fellow citizenship due to the faith of Yah in Yahushua, then Yasharel are the saints. And the Ephesians, who are Hebrews from outside of Yasharel, are now fellow saints as well. And we're going to prove this in Scripture a little later in the lesson, that saints it references um, Yasharel. There's a couple of verses you can pull to prove that. Okay. All right. Anybody mm -hmm. have any questions? No. No? Okay. Yeah. No. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Let's move to Ephesians 4, 7 and 8. Sister Lily, do you mind reading for us, please? Sister Lily, Sister Sister Lily, I'm sorry. Speak up just a little bit for us. Sorry about that. Can you hear me better? Oh, that's oh, much yes. better. <laughs> okay, sorry. But unto every one of us is giving grace according to the measure of the gift of Mashiach. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Thank you, Sister Lily. 
And I will thank Minister White for helping me understand this one. <laughs> because when I first read this and I kept thinking about it, ooh, I did not fully get it because the, the wording was so peculiar to me. But Paul is quoting um, David in Psalm 68, 18. And the church does not care to look and see why Paul is quoting this. Psalm 68, 18 says, Thou hast ascended on high. Mm -hmm. All right. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that Yahuwah might dwell among them. Before we dig into this, if we, Yah was talking about sinners, you know he wouldn't be dwelling among them like that, right? So he must be talking about his people. And since we know that David has wrote this, you know he's not just writing it to some random audience and Gentiles. So Paul would not use this to reference a group of people that are not Israel. We cannot assign something that was written to Hebrews to automatically now hundreds of years later. I think, what is it, 600 years? David lived about, what, 600 years ago prior to, prior to, to the Messiah? Okay. Prior to the Messiah? Uh, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Me neither, me neither. I know it was hundreds of years. The, the, the point is, Paul does not have the authority to re-sign scripture, reassign a scripture to a, another audience, a whole different group of people. That's not what this is doing. So let's take a look at what this really meant, captivity, captive, and rebellious. Captivity is captured or exiled, and that's the word sh shebi. Captive is Shabbat into mm. captivity. All right. Yahusha has received gifts. Now let's think about this. So he's saying Yahusha has received gifts for them from Yahuwah to give to the captive, the exiled, the rebellious, because Israel has a history of being pretty rebellious. Don't we? <laughs> we are stubborn. So that Yah can dwell among his people. Th does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay, so let's take a look on the next slide and put it all together and then prove how Paul was supporting his own statement in the previous letter that he wrote. Let's restate it. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led the exile into captivity. Thou hast received gifts from Yah for them. Yea, the rebellious also, that Yah Elohim might dwell among them. Now we know he's talking about Yahushua because this is what Paul was talking about. He's talking about the Messiah removing the partition, right? So we got to keep in context to the Ephesian letter to know that this is referencing Yahushua. Now, Yahushua gathered the exiled Hebrews, making them captives of righteousness. So that's what the captivity means. He took the exiled, those who were rebellious, those who have been sinners, those who, those who have been separated. This is why Paul is saying this verse to the Ephesians. They were exiled. Remember, the northern kingdoms got exiled many centuries ago and have not been able to reconnect with Israel or Yahuwah because of the lack of their obedience. This is the reason why Paul is using this verse because it speaks explicitly to the exile. Now this time though, Yahushua is going to take the exile and bring them into captivity, but a different form of captivity. And Paul speaks to it in, in Romans 6 and 18 through 20, where he says, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity unto iniquity, which is lawlessness to lawlessness. Even so now yield your members servants of righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. See how it's, he does. <laughs> I love it. How Paul does a contradiction. You're going to either be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. When you're a slave to sin, you're free from righteousness. But if you're a slave to righteousness, you're free from sin. 
And the reason why you're a slave to righteousness is because it is a lifelong dedication. There's works in righteousness as well. The word servant is doulos or dolos, a slave, involuntary or voluntary. All right, so now you see what Yahushua was doing. He was bringing them into righteous captivity. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? And are there any questions? We're going to still, we need to do a little more in this just to get the full picture. All right. Let's, let's move to the next one. Now, these gifts that Yahushua is giving, it's for those prodigal sons. Remember the exile, the ones who chose to sin, like the prodigal son was like, listen, give me what's mine and let me go. I'm going to go do my thing in the world. That's what these exiled did. Ephesians did. And when the prodigal son came back, what did the father do? He gave gifts. He was happy. So Luke 15, 11 through 15. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and divided it unto them and un unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Boy, that's messed up. So he, you see, so this just gives you an idea of the prodigal son. We're going to read more into this, all right? And we continue with the prodigal son. And he, and he would, and he, and he would fain have and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So are you seeing how this correlates with the Ephesians, the Galatians, the Colossians, the Corinthians, the Thessalonians? These were the prodigal sons. These were the exiles. These were the ones that chose to sin in the, before they got scattered, chose to break Torah, thinking they knew what they wanted. Now... When Yahushua shows them the truth, they realize who they are, and now they want to come back to the Father. All right? Let's, let's continue to finish the prodigal son. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be married, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. Dead how? Physically? No. Spiritually? Yes. Lost? Yes. That's exactly what Yahushua calls these scattered, these exiled, lost, and they were spiritually dead because they had no Torah. Everybody follows. Following. Okay. Now, we realize that those gifts 
were given to those who are the prodigal son, to the to those who have turned back. Now, these are gifts of celebration because now these are children that have been exiled and separated because of their own choices and have returned to, to Yah through the gift that the son, Yahusha, has provided. Now, just to show you who's rebellious according to scripture, just to build on our understanding so far. There was only one group of people that can be rebellious because you have to have something to rebel against. Um, Brother Dawi, Brother David, can you read these three verses for me, please? Nice and loud. Uh, he is in the Christian. Oh, okay. Um, Brother, brother, I'm going to pass it to you, sir. All right. What do you need me to read? Um, the, the, one of it? the three verses that are on the screen. Yes, sir. Only. Deuteronomy 9 and 24. You have been rebellious against Yahuwah from the day that I knew you. Isaiah 30 and 1. Woe to the rebellious children, saith Yahuwah, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Jeremiah 4, 16 through 17. Make ye mention to the nations, behold, publish against Jerusalem, that watchers come from a far country, and give out of their voice against the cities of Judah. As keepers of a field, are they against her, her, her roundabout? Because she hath been rebellious against me. Yahoo. All right. Thank you, brother, brother. I want to point out okay. something here. Notice that Yasharel is called a nation in, in, um, in Jeremiah, for example. So, the, uh, you know, when you see the word nation, even in the New Testament, in many times, especially when Gentiles mistranslate, it's really speaking to Yasharel. But here we know now that you cannot be rebellious unless you have something to rebel against. Other nations did not have that. Secondly, Israel, Yasharel, has been called rebellious by Yah himself and the prophets. So, honestly, who, who is Paul talking to right now? Then? Could he be talking to anybody else but Yasharel? Mm -hmm. No. All right, do we have any questions so far? None so far. Okay, let's, let's, yeah. let's go to the next slide just to put it all together. Paul quoted the prophecy of King David about Yahushua. What's what clarifies the audience is the following, excuse the apostrophe S, that's not needed, but what clarifies the audience is this. Yahushua came for the exiled and rebellious. Can't be another nation, right? It's the exiled and rebellious. Mm -hmm. Is that the world? The whole world exiled and rebellious? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, don't, that wouldn't even fit in the common sense of anybody. Yahushua made them or us slaves or captives to righteousness. Because we showed in Romans 6, when you are a, a servant of, of, of sin, you are free from righteousness, Paul says, mm -hmm. right? So the other way around goes as well. If you are a slave to righteousness, you are free from sin and death. Mm -hmm. And he, Yahushua came to give gifts of the father to the prodigal sons that we were talking about, the exile. And those gifts are what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And he says this in Ephesians in verse 11, by the way, if you continue to read, he builds on this, these gifts. And these gifts were to prepare us for Yah to dwell among us. Mm -hmm. Because that's what he was saying. He literally quoted a prophecy of David that was very particular about exiles to a group of people who are exiled. Mm -hmm. It fits. It fits. So this is what Paul is saying 
saying Yahusha has done to the Ephesians and to all, to all, talk to all of his people. Let me be specific. Paul called them exiled captives, pretty much. That's what he was called. <laughs> referencing, referencing a rebellious people. So who, who else can this audience be? Just by examining the sources of Paul's comments, you really get a full picture of everything. That's true. All right. Any questions or anything? Anybody want to add? Nothing so far. Nothing so far. Mm -mm. All right. So let's continue. Minister White, do you mind reading that please, for me, please? Sure. This I say, therefore, and testify in Yahusha, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of Elohim through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. All right. So he's, you see, he says the ignorance, right? So Paul supports our understanding of trespassing of Torah, which we spoke in, in reference to the last um, lesson. All right. Uh, lesson 13. And these other nations, Gentiles, are alienated from the life of Elohim due to ignorance. All right, due to ignorance. Now, remember, alienated means what we talked about, to be shut out from one's fellowship. All right, so he's, Paul didn't just deal with the Ephesians, did he? He dealt with other groups. He dealt with, like we said, the Galatians, the Thessalonians, and so on. The, the Corinthians, the Colossians, Philippia. All that region. He's, I don't know. I don't think he came home, but maybe once a year or so, if they, if he wasn't arrested, if he can get home for the feast days, he wasn't arrested or something. He was always gone. So it's important for us to continue as we read Paul's letters, not to forget what he's already said. And this is something the church doesn't do. They take one statement or one verse and say they have an understanding of what he meant when Paul writes complicated letters with great understanding of the scriptures. So if you want to understand Paul's letter, read the Old Testament. Because that's where he teaches from. All right. Anybody else? Um, I'd like to make a, a comment about, I think it's verse 18. It, it says, um, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of Elohim through the ignorance. I want to pause right there. Notice it said being alienated from the life of Elohim. It didn't say being alienated from the word. It said being alienated from the life. Why did he choose to say, why did he choose to say it that way? It's because when you're, when you are obedient to Torah, it's a life style. It's not a religion. It's not a religion. So when you do not know Torah, it's not that you do not know the Bible. You do not know the life. You do not know the lifestyle of Elohim. That is what that word means. You're alienated from the lifestyle. And you're also alienated from eternal life mm -hmm. as well. But you're alienated from the life. You're alienated from the way of life, the way Yah's people live due to the ignorance that's in you. So that ignorance needs to be removed. That blindness needs to be removed. And that is removed by the word of the Most High. So once you have the word of the Most High, it should change your life. It changes your life, your lifestyle, and it also gives you access to, to Yahuwah's life, eternal life. It does all of that. I wanted to highlight that piece of the scripture. Mm -hmm. Thank That's you. very good. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. All right. Anybody else? All righty. Let's continue. Now, I'd like to point these words out that what we're going to discuss today. Um, I'll pick on Sister Sister Lily. Oh, no, Sister Billy. I'm sorry. Can you read, please? Yes. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. Yep. Who being past a feeling have given themselves over unto lavishness, 
to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned, Mashiach. If so, be that he, be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Yahushua. All right. Thank you, Sister Bill. Now, as, as stated earlier, uncleanness is mentioned due to Paul's Hebrew understanding of the word. He wouldn't mention this with some other type of reference point. Why would he? That'd be like me understanding what a car is. But when I speak to somebody else, I meant it, meant it as a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I said car, but I really meant motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Why would I change the understanding of a word just because the audience is different? This is a Hebraic word reference. Mm -hmm. It must be looked at from a Hebraic perspective. Uncleanness is specific. It's specified in Torah. Uncleanness is a condition that is a concern for those who were given Torah, mm -hmm. not the world. They didn't have clean laws. And I'm not talking about no bad stuff either. I'm talking about in, in your way of life, the way you dressed, the way you touched things, what was killed, what was eaten, how it was killed, all those things. How it was prepped, everything. So think about this. Paul is writing a letter mentioning uncleanness, but he doesn't define it. No. Why? Because it's already defined. It's already known, right? It's already known. Yeah. <laughs> Think about that. He didn't say those who work on cleanliness, which you will find in the Torah, and it's such and such and such. He didn't say that. Mm -hmm. The audience already knew it. The audience already knew what that meant. And we're definitely not taught to think that way about it, about, about the scriptures. True. All right. I hope that that's pretty clear for everyone. Anybody has anything else they they want to mm -hmm. add? No. Mm -hmm. All right. Is Brother David available? I got us. Yeah. All right, brother, brother, brother David, read that for me, please. Well, Brother David, you'll have to speak up. We, ca we can't hear you. We're for putting away lies. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members of members one of another. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brother. Now, neighbor is an important concept to learn when it comes to scripture because it is a Hebraic perspective. That's who Paul is thinking of when he writes this. Paul did not have a Christian. They will tell you in a minute. This was Christianity. Go look up your Christian history and tell me when it was created. Your own history books will tell you that it wasn't created at this time. What the Christian church tries to do is claim the early body of believers as their own and say, see, because they teach Mashiach, they must be Christians by default. Mm -hmm. No, Christians stole Mashiach hmm. and claimed it for themselves. And thus the early church or the early believers was um is that yours or mine? Mine, mine let me get the mouse out of the way i hit the i hit your mouse by accident okay where it go here it is okay mm -hmm. sorry about that um but the early church the early body of believers didn't practice religion just like minister white said it was a way of life but when the religion was created by the early catholic church the romans they took possession of what was written in mashiach and claimed it as their own the first several hundred years, at almost 300 years, were no religion. Um, ex there was no religion that existed that influenced them. That to to as in Christianity, they had religious issues. The worshippers of Serapis was one of the biggest ones at the time. But when it came to the scriptures, it was theirs. It got stolen, especially after the fall of Judah, Jerusalem. In the around 70 AD and Israel was scattered completely, completely gone. They could not control how the scriptures were used anymore. And Rome took full advantage of it. So what would be a neighbor according to the original scriptures is what we need to learn. And we will clarify that once we get to the first letter of Timothy. All right. We won't go into it right now. I just wanted to speak to how Paul is talking of something and we cannot forget who he is. 
If I read a book written by a child, can I expect her to have the understanding as an adult? No, I need to make sure I'm reading the child's book. So I'm not going to get everything I think I'm going to get out of it. If I read a book by a physicist, do you think I'm going to sit here and understand it as a layman? I have to understand this is a physicist, so I need to understand how he thinks and where he's referencing to even understand what he's writing. That means I got to go look at stuff he knows. I just can't get it by reading his stuff. Go read a published paper by some type of researcher and see how lost you are. Mm-hmm. Especially in heavy sciences, you'll be lost. If you don't know the material before you read it, you won't understand. Mm-hmm. That's Paul's letters. You're not going to understand Paul's letters unless you understand what he got the material from. You got to understand Paul's education. He's a he's a physicist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's a scripture physicist. <laughs> He's so advanced in this stuff that you just can't read his stuff without knowing his education and understanding some, at least some of it. But the church doesn't teach that. They think you can read his book, his letters and, and just read it from a new age perspective, a new Testament perspective only. Mm-hmm. And none of it came from that. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Any, any ads with this one? No. No, no. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think this next one will be next two, I said will be. Did we go over who a neighbor is? No, we're gonna do that in Timothy. Okay. The letter of Timothy. So I'm a hold I'm gonna hold off on that. Okay. We'll build on that in Timothy. But I just wanted to bring it up that Paul is speaking of it even in Ephesians. But if he speaks the word to Timothy, does it change the difference? The definition, why would it? No, if I no. said, if I talked to somebody and said the word neighbor, did just because I'm speaking to a different person, it changes the definition of neighbor? No, it doesn't. We can't say that. So if he says it to Timothy a certain way, he said it to the Ephesians the same way. I agree. All right. So um, let's see. Sister Lily, you mind reading this one for us, please? Nice and loud. <laughs> Peter Hook, Ephesians 5, 5 through 6. For, ye, ye, for this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Mashiach, and of Elohim. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of Elohim upon the children of disobedience. Thank you. Thank you. Now, he speaks of unclean once again, but then he says children of disobedience. So we know that you can't disobey unless you've been given something to obey. And we know that the Bible speaks of what is being obeyed and disobeyed all throughout it, and that's Torah. And we know who was given Torah. We know that. Paul speaks again of uncleanness, right? Now, the inheritance is the in the kingdom of Mashiach, which we discussed earlier. Now, if the inheritance is the, is the, or is in the kingdom of Mashiach, and Mashiach came for Yasharel, which we spoke of in Romans 9 and 4, then who has rights to the inheritance? Think about that. He just said to the Ephesians, who quote unquote supposedly be, supposed to be non-Israel, that any inheritance in the kingdom of Mashiach, right? They don't have, they, the, the, I'm sorry, the inheritance in the kingdom of Mashiach. And since we know that we've talked about this inheritance, and Romans 9 and 4 says it, then who really has the inheritance? Who has that right? So Ephesians cannot be some random people that aren't Hebrews. It goes against common sense. Not, I mean, it's, it's right there in our faces. The church will use the adoption scriptures, but we went over that, that that adoption was specific. And he says it in nine and four also that 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 whole series of verses in chapter nine is Yasharel has the adoption, the inheritance, the promises, the giving of the law and so on. The same Paul that's speaking to Ephesians. So why didn't he say in there it was given to everybody else, too? He didn't say that there. All right. Any anybody want to talk to this? Any any additions? No. Okay. Yeah. 
So let's take a look at disobedience. It is apithia, and it's obstinate opposition to the divine will. <laughs> That's pretty strong opposition. Um, and what is the divine will? Paul David says it in Psalms 40 and 8. I delight to do thy will, O my Elohim. Yea, thy Torah is in my heart. So the will of Yah is his Torah. Can you imagine saying that Yah's will is no longer needed? Can you can you imagine that you have an opposition, obstinate opposition to his will? And you can say that to the straight. And I didn't make this stuff up. <clears throat> this is scripture. Mm -hmm. But we're going to look at just to impact it a little more. Let's look at will. And just to add to it, I love this definition. The word will in the Hebrew, in this, in, according to Psalms, is ratzon. Hmm. It's will or desire. But in the paleo, it's resh, sadiq, wa, nun. Resh is the intellect, a man who chooses to learn. Because we're talking about the, the positive version of this resh, a person who chooses. Sadi is the man lying on his side, a righteous man, synonymous with Sadiq, which was righteous. You know, I can imagine a man laying on his side at the feet of Mashiach to learn, right? Wa is the tent peg, which is the connection, the connection to Yah, to the hearer. Yah to the hearer. And Nun is the seed, the Torah, which sprouts new life in us. So a man who chooses to learn is connected to Torah. The righteous man lays on his side at the feet of his teacher. It's the righteous man, Yah, hears. So the will of Yah is for you to be connected to Torah. Just like Psalm says. <laughs> Just like the Psalm says. Isn't that something? So most of us don't look at it that way. But even the ancient Hebrew agrees with it. Okay, everybody follow? Any questions or additions to this? All right, I think we're going to end it here. We do have a little more on this verse, but I think we're going to be running a, a little bit long if we do. So if there's no additional questions, um, I thank you for joining the house. Show. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yeah, just, just on the Hebrew, Hello Hebrew. Mm-hmm. The third one down. That's mm -hmm. oh wow. Okay, wow. Oh, okay. Never mind. I see it now. <laughs> I got it. You Sorry. Know, that's okay. <laughs> that, the, the wa is unique because it really just is a connection point. Mm -hmm. It brings a relationship to what was said before it, to a relationship to what's said after it. It connects what's above it to what's below it. So the righteous man that's on his side is right, right. So when you think of a tent peg that connects the <laughs> tent line to the ground so the tent can stand, mm -hmm. so the house can stand True. without the, being yeah. that connection, the house, the temple, you would fall without connection mm -hmm. to the Torah. You, your house cannot stand. Mm -hmm. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that beautiful? How, how the paleo Hebrew speaks. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, me too, okay. Sister Billy. Yeah, well, that's a good question. I'm glad I you said. Like, that. I was looking for that. So. Oh yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. I like to use "wa" because it's really there's no real "v" in Hebrew, so I use the "wa" instead. Yeah. But you're right. I, normally, I put a little oh, slash yeah. "bob" so people don't get confused because not everybody says "wa" like I do. So. All right, but well, yeah. thank you, Sister Billy. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate the question because it just brought out a little bit more. That's all. Mm -hmm. All right, thank well, you. oh, you're welcome. So I'm going ahead and end it. I know we're we're at the time, so we're going to build on this Ephesians five verse five and six a little more in part fifteen. So thank you for jo um, for joining the House of Sheila Ministries on Yah's Holy Shabbat. Mm -hmm. We thank you all for joining us. Please come again um, next Shabbat next week. We continue in the series of Paul's letters. Thank you and shalom, everyone. Shalom.